I needed a little intro music for myself. <laughs> Do you see it? This is what space feels like. This is the feeling of people coming together to create space. Your listening and watching right now aren't just about you taking something in. In this moment, you are actively creating the space that is necessary for me and all of the other speakers and performers today to share ideas and stories. You are makers of space. So, permit me to fill the space with this, a chain of dormant volcanoes that create the island of Flores in eastern Indonesia in Southeast Asia. They are covered with emerald green bamboo, and we are there with our friends and colleagues. It's 11 p.m., and we are going to a wedding party. There's an enormous tent, and in the tent, there are people who are dancing, dancing and moving to the music that comes out of speakers that everyone in the village has brought. So everyone brings their giant speaker and contributes to this awesome sound. The photos that you see are stills from the video I make during breaks from dancing my butt off. This, which you know, is like my thing, this is joy. But the next morning, we will get up and with our friends, go to homes across the village to ask people this. What is it like knowing that your way of life may soon no longer be possible? You see, I work with communities all over the world that live on what I've come to call the front lines of climate change. These are people for whom global warming is making it harder and harder to access clean water, grow or access food, and also generate an income. These are people for whom, in the next 80 years, the environment may impose the choice of needing to give up their entire way of life because of changes that are occurring. So, my job now is to go into schools like this one, universities, community centers and libraries across our country, and bring the voices of these people from the front lines of climate change to tell the story of what is going on to Americans. Because it is us, our ancestors and our own consumption habits and the policies of our government that have created the situation that these people on the front lines are facing today. When people with as much power as Americans have don't make space for others in their worldview, it can mean that our behavior doesn't make space for others in the world. The path that led me to teach, document, and create in collaboration with communities on the front lines of climate change began when I was in high school. You see, I was the first openly gay kid in my town. It meant that when I went to come out of the closet, I wasn't exactly sure what space there was for me to come out into. I grew up on an island off the coast of Florida. My town wasn't that small, but it could certainly be small-minded. Being a queer kid in that kind of space was very difficult. I could do a whole other talk on what it was like to come out in death threats and being spit on, but we'll leave that for another time. The, the experience I had there led me to go into the woods to spend time on the beach on my island because nature doesn't judge. As I spent time in the woods and swimming, I started to realize that nature too is marginalized, that our society isn't making space for nature just like it wasn't making space for a queer kid like me. You see, my island is going to go underwater probably in the next 80 years, but nobody there is talking about it. It's easier not to. As I had this realization that my own marginalization was connected to the marginalization of nature and all other people, for whatever reason, they are marginalized, I started to become that really obnoxious kid who brings up big 
issues when you're just about to relax. Back in those days, no, seriously, I was so, you know, we'd be like in line at the grocery store and they'd say, paper or plastic? And I'd say, well, plastic is oil and oil is war. Um, and the, the, the person bagging would be like, uh. Um, or my family would be sitting down to watch American Idol, which was like the voice back then. And Fantasia, I remember, she was on stage singing Gershwin, summertime. And I'd be like, it's getting longer and longer. And everyone would just look at me and I'd be like, they should be singing about that. <laughs> but eventually, I was able to turn the sense of urgency I felt about making space for nature and climate change into some of the most productive decisions of my life. I actually left high school when I was 15, and then in college, went to West Africa for a year, and then India, and as soon as I graduated college, went back to India on a fellowship to work for a human rights organization, and after a year of that, decided I was gonna live in Asia for the rest of my life. And so I got a job running study abroad programs in India and Indonesia, in which I brought high school and college students to the periphery of their world to discover that it is the center of someone else's. Then, a year ago, I decided that it was time to bring my work of connecting people across borders and cultures, of making space for voices we rarely hear, to a bigger platform. In the four years that I run study abroad programs, I only taught 100 students, but now, by using media, film, photography, live storytelling, I'm able to connect thousands of people, sometimes a thousand people in a day, to all of these people who live on the front lines of climate change. So as an example, this is my buddy Thais. Thais lives in a village in Indonesia over the sea. His ethnic group, the Bajau people, they're called sea nomads because they live in boats and houses on stilts in the ocean. And their lives are intimately connected to the coral reef ecosystem where they get their food and spend their time having fun as well. But the coral reef ecosystem is going extinct because of human activities. And when Thais and his buddies sit around and talk, they are filled with doubt about what their futures hold for them. They can't necessarily be fishermen, and they, they want to go to college, but they don't have the money to do that. They want to learn foreign languages. They want to be sports stars. They're probably not that different from you. And I discovered that by sitting with them and making space to hear their voices. This is Tsetan Angmo. Tsetan Angmo is from the Himalayan region of Ladakh, way, way up high on the Tibetan plateau, pretty much the opposite end of the climate spectrum from Thais. In her region, all of the water comes from glaciers, glaciers that are melting because of global warming. Sometime in the next 80 to 100 years, Tsetan Angmo may have to deal with the reality that her entire region is uninhabitable. And even though her people and her culture have grown out of that region for over a thousand years, she may have to migrate making her one of what will become millions of people that are climate refugees. In this photograph, Tsetan Angmo is standing in front of boulders that were carried down in landslides that happened in 2010, when a completely unprecedented weather event created rain of the kind is that is never seen in this region, that took huge amounts of earth down the sides of mountains, because there are no trees to hold things together, and washed out entire villages. Tsetan Angmo is standing next to her house, which was bulldozed by these boulders and earth. So even though the future is, is a confusing, unsure time because of climate change, even in the present, people your age all over the world are dealing with the effects of climate change. You know, we think of the developing world here in America often as, as a place where we should go to build toilets and wells and schools. But when you make space for others, you have to first allow yourself to be schooled before you can build a school. So what I do in Ladakh is work with students like Tsetan Angmo to go speak with elders all across the region and interview them about the effects of climate change because they are the people that have watched over 70, 80, 90 years the glaciers recede. I want to challenge you today not to step aside in creating space, but to step up to step up for justice, to step up for the environment. 
All of you have capacity to create space for others in your own community and in your school. And high school is one of the most important places to create space. Not just because you need space for your new identities and fresh ideas, but because high school needs to be a place where you train in making space for others. Where you learn not just to make your own voice louder, but to help amplify the voices of people and the environment when they are not being heard. It brings me back to my island, the one that's going underwater. It's become a kind of metaphor for me beyond the literal reality of sea level rise. People still aren't talking about climate change on my island. They would prefer to believe that it doesn't exist. And the governor of Florida has even mandated that climate change not be uttered within our state government. We cannot move forward into the future if there is no space to step out into. We cannot move forward if there isn't space for intelligent dialogue, for nature, for science, and above all, for one another. Because if we do not create space for reality, what we lose, like my island, may be gone forever. That's why, through what I love, I'm committed to creating a future where everyone is willing and capable of making space for others. What do you love? make it into something that creates space for others. Let's all bring our speakers to the party and make room for the whole world to dance. Thank you.